Today I thought I smelt a whiff of smoke, maybe from a cigarette or from a distant fire. It's more likely to be from a distant fire. In so many years' time, it's the smell of your cremation. You can, <laughs> in deep samadhi, you can see it distant, coming closer and closer and closer. So, leave off all the smoking until you die. Then you can smoke as much as you like. <laughs> so, you know, smoking is all banned in this monastery of all types. Smoking cigarettes, smoking trees, or um, smoking dying. So, please, no smoking in this monastery or this retreat center. While doing meditation in the afternoon, my mind was very dark. Was it your mind which was dull, or was it just the mind which was dull? When it's my mind, it's my problem. When it's just mind is dull, it doesn't matter. Nothing to do with me, not my business. Woohoo! Suddenly, an <laughs> my mind was very dull. Suddenly, an image of me doing the kangaroo hopping meditation <laughs> popped into my mind. I was hopping down the walkway and the retreats were smiling and laughing at me. I immediately, my breath appeared and my mind brightened up. Somehow, in the dullness of my mind, your teachings are still able to help. Miracle. Did you actually do it, though? Don't just think about it. Do it. Okay, put your hands up if you've done kangaroo walking meditation yet. <laughs> yes, we have one, two. Very good. How many times? Just back and forth, once or twice? Or just only once. Oh, come on. A real kangaroo doesn't just go back and then start walking. You've got at least half an hour. <laughs> Did anyone see you? Ah, oh, what a shame. <laughs> Next time, please make sure people see you. Then it makes them happy. And then you're being compassionate to all other beings. You make them laugh. Now that's a good point, seriously though, that you see the mind was dull. And you just put in something happy, something joyful, do something a little bit different, then you, all the dullness disappears. So if you are really sleepy, don't get in that walking meditation. Just do one or two circuits of, of kangaroo walking meditation. I guarantee your dullness and everyone else who sees you will disappear. <laughs> and it's good fun. Is it true that it's possible to feel the breath energy throughout the body and that you could even feel it coming through your pores? Yeah, I mean, why don't you do the ordinary breath? You know, you're watching the breath go in, go out, go in, go out, and then it becomes very peaceful and still. Soon, I haven't said this, but it's actually an interesting part of meditation. Sometimes you lose the breath, you can't find it, but actually you are still breathing. So what is happening? You are no longer feeling the breath you know, through this, the fifth sense of touch. You are knowing the breath through the mind. It's a mental breath which you are knowing which is slightly different. So you're not feeling the breath, you're knowing the breath. The two are a bit different. So when you get to that mental image of the breath, that's where it can do anything. It can do really weird and strange things. You can breathe through your ear, breathe through your right toe, wherever you want to do it. You can come through your pores. It's not the real physical body, <coughs> it's just this big mental image which you have. Once you get that stage, you're right on the edge of uh, nimittas. So yeah, you can do all sorts of things with the breath energy. Dear, we have new teachers this afternoon. Ajahn Fly, who visited both Jhana Grove and Bodhinyana Meditation Hall. It was probably the same Fly who, who, who went with you. He realized you were going to Bodhinyana and he wanted to go and have a look. And it probably came back with you because the Fly probably lives at Jhana Grove. <laughs> he just hitched a ride with you. Isn't it wonderful, Ajahn Fly? Did it disturb you? Sometimes it's only a little fly. It has no diseases over in Australia. So they're very, very safe, the flies. And because they live in Jhana Grove or they live over in Bodhinyana, they are Buddhist flies. <laughs> so they're just trying to be compassionate. They're just coming to say hello. And just, you know, always remember to say, the door of my nose is open to you, fly. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's what they do. Now, I remember with Ajahn Fry once, I was teaching in Dolomara some time, actually quite a few years ago, and I said, it's only a fly for goodness sake, it doesn't hurt, it's not going to bite, and just let it sort of do what it needs to do, it doesn't hurt at all. 
at least you can enjoy a fly sort of walking over you. And of course, as soon as you say that, when I started meditating, the fly landed on me. You know, I wanted to blow it off. <laughs> but you knew people were watching you, and I just said, just let it be. So, you know, I was really stuffed. I either could blow it off and be a hypocrite, or just practice what I preach for a change. <laughs> I couldn't decide to practice what I preach. It was really, I'm just mindful of the fly. You know what it did? It was a Buddhist fly. This was in Nolamara Temple, because it started here and went around three times. <laughs> exactly three times. Which, as you all know, is the way we worship shrines. You know, it's called circumambulation. You go around one, two, three times of a Buddha statue or a, a stupa, a chedi or whatever. So this is what the fly was doing. It was just worshipping me. It went around three times. <laughs> and after we finished the third one, it went away again, never came back again. That's all they really want to do, to worship you. <laughs> but, but what you find out, you know, that flies, they don't hurt, they're just tickly. And when it was over here, that wasn't no, any problem, but just on the edges of my mouth, that's the most tickly. So after a while, you know, when it got to here, that was really hard to endure because it's so tickly. When it got past the edge, it was okay. And then, of course, you had the anticipation, you're going to come to the edge again, this is going to be very difficult. <laughs> but once it got past there, you were okay again. So, you know, three times round, and it soon went away. It's nothing, it didn't kill you or anything, but you actually learned just which is the most tickly part of your mouth which is just these parts. That's my mouth anyway. You try and see if yours is the same. <laughs> Next time <laughs> a fly comes, you're just aware and you're kind. You know, the kindfulness. And then it's not a problem at all. It's actually a bit of fun, a bit of a game, and it's interesting. You certainly don't get dull, you know, when the fly is, you know, crawling up your nose and down your nose again. It's just, you know, look for a cave to meditate in. That's all the, the fly is doing. So this is a great way to overcome your sloth and torpor. Because you can't be sleepy when a fly is you know, all over you. And of course, they don't hurt, they're not dangerous. So it's great to call it Ajahn Fly. Well done. Dear Ajahn, since Sunday evening before going to bed, I st started noticing this sound humming in my right ear. It sounds like the tumbling of the laundry dryer. It's, that's a weird thing to describe. The tumbling of the laundry dryer. It's quite hard to describe, but this beating sound will be audible whenever surrounding is quiet if you're sitting alone going to bed. I tried to apply, apply kindness and open my heart to this humming sound in the past days, but I do wonder at times why I'm experiencing such ear humming for the first time in my life. I'm wondering if you have any other advice, how I can let go of this concern and worry. Thank you. Ah, if it sounds like the laundry dryer, it must be you're drying something in your brain or something. <laughs> and it's tumbling up and down as you you dry out all the defilements and other stuff. So a lot of times, whenever we make it a problem and a difficulty, we can't get rid of it. And it keeps buzzing in our brain again and again and again and again. So the best thing to do is just see if you can ignore it. Now this is one good way of <coughs> ignoring things. You use what the Buddha calls substitution. In other words, you focus on something else especially if it's something very, very enjoyable. If you were watching a movie, then after a while you probably wouldn't even notice the humming in the, in the ear or in the brain, wherever it is, because the movie is more enjoyable and you just can't be bothered with this humming. Now, if you haven't got anything enjoyable, then it's much harder, then obviously you go to this humming business. So, number one, you can actually try going into the forest and listening to the birds, listening to the wind in the trees. Listen to sound which is beautiful and natural, which will supplant that other sound. And if you are sitting down meditating, then you can be able to maybe watch your breathing. And if that sound comes, now this is the, the simile of the TV set. Make sure that your main object of breath is in the middle of the screen. And you can hear that buzzing, but it's on the edge somewhere. Don't make it the main thing, making a problem, because if it's a problem, if you're really concerned about it, it's right in the center of your mental screen. Now the way this works, as I often say, if you have a TV and you watch a movie on the TV, or watch some sport or some documentary or anything on the TV, you may notice after a few, no, not even minutes, a few seconds, you cannot see the edge of the screen anymore. You cannot see what's on top of the TV, underneath or to the sides. Your mind actually focuses in 
to that area in the center of the screen where the action is, and you can't even see the edge of the screen. The frame is disappeared. And that is why you see people on the aircraft now looking at this tiny screen, and they still enjoy the movie. Because even in a tiny screen, if you go back to Singapore or Malaysia, wherever you go back to, or New Zealand, you know, try that. Watch a movie on the screen, and you will notice after a little while, you know, you can't see the edges anymore. You can't see the back of the seat. All you can see is the movie. Your mind has fitted into that little space. And it is precisely the same, no different than if you have one of these huge plasma screen TVs like they have these days. It doesn't matter how big the screen is, it's how big your mind is. And your mind adjusts itself to fit into the screen. You notice that, whether it's a big screen or a small screen, once you focus, the experience is precisely the same, then you don't have to buy these huge you know, plasma screen TVs, which cost a fortune. You can just buy a small TV, you'll have precisely the same experience, and you can give the difference in the cost to the nuns' monastery. <laughs> <laughs> but, the point of that is that you'd actually fit into the screen, and this is what we do with focusing. So if you actually have the center of the screen, say on the breath, when you first <coughs> are watching, yeah, you can, you can hear that buzzing, you can hear the sound of people moving, it's, you even have thoughts, but it's not in the center of the screen. The center is, say, with the breath, and you don't know when this happens, but it always happens. After a while, you've just got the breath, and everything else has fallen off the edge of the screen. In the same way, when you watch a, a TV, you know, the, the frame of the TV disappears. You don't know when, but after a while, you can't see it anymore. You're focused in to what you think is really important. But if the distraction is important, in other words, this buzzing in the ear is important, in that center screen, then the breath falls off, everything else falls off, and all you've got is the buzzing. So that is actually how the brain works. Whatever you give most important to, you focus on it, everything on the edge disappears. All right, focus on me. Now you'll find the monk sitting uh, on one side of me, he's totally disappeared, you can't see him anymore. Vanish. The Buddha statue has vanished. It's amazing, when you focus in, you just, what's important is all that actually there is, and everything else on the edge vanishes. So if you make, say, the breath the most important, then all that noise will just disappear. And it's amazing, once it does disappear and you ignore it, it usually just disappears once and forever. Or at least and if it comes back again, it's not that strong. So that's how to deal with that one. Dear Ajahn Bob, not only do my cheeks ache from all the laughing and big smiles, but my heart has the same joyous ache from stretching so wide open. Thank you for showing the way. If your cheeks ache because of all the laughing and smiles, it means you haven't done enough laughing and smiling before you came here. You need to do some more exercise. So you're fit, so there's no aches anymore. It's just like people who go and play tennis or play soccer and they don't do exercise, they feel stiff after the game. They should have exercised beforehand. So if you feel stiff after all the laughing, it means you didn't do enough exercise when you were back in Singapore or Malaysia or wherever you come from. So, remember, 20 push-ups every morning. <laughs> One, two, three. So that way that your cheeks and your lips are very strong, which means you don't, you won't get the cheek ache anymore. How do, we <laughs> How do we make sense of such horrific tragedies such as the Newtown Massacre, in which a 20-year-old teenager shot and killed his mother along with 26 kindergartners and preschoolers before killing himself? What if those were one of our children? How should we react? How do we cope with such a loss? Thanks with Mega Meta. Okay, now first of all, it's nice and easy to say, just, well, you know, this happens in life, let it go. You know, you once they're shot, they're killed, you can't do anything about it, except make sure it never happens again. And that's why, you know, the guns in the United States, you know, just, it's incredibly stupid. I don't mind keep on saying this, it's a social issue, it's a moral issue. But the fact that people think they need guns to protect themselves, when everybody knows in other jurisdictions like Australia, you know, the murder rate is less, we don't need guns to protect ourselves, but guns kill people. And so, you know, sometimes you know that you may have an argument with somebody, and sometimes people get so irate, if there was a gun there, you might have shot someone already. Fortunately, there was no guns around, so you didn't kill somebody. 
So those guns are absolutely ridiculous in the United States. So number one, we, it's very hard, but we have to keep on saying, especially as Buddhists, there's a lot of Buddhists in the United States, they should be at the forefront of gun control and say, you know, no more guns. It's really crazy what the <coughs> guns they have. But if that was you, and there was a tragedy, you know, your child died, and it's not just with um, being shot by someone, it can be you know, with a car crash, it can be a wall falling down, there's all sorts of different ways we might die. What do you do? And of course, the first thing is that, you know, we just get so disappointed a person didn't have the full life. At least as a Buddhist, you know that they'll have another chance. They died young, but they'll have another chance to get reborn again and maybe have a better chance next time. So, dying is not the end of the world when you believe in rebirth. And if you don't believe in reincarnation, you will in your next life. So we don't... <laughs> <laughs> but what a wonderful understanding it is. It is actually true. You do get reborn, reincarnated. And so it takes away the finality when some places they say, a kid, only six years old, they didn't have a life. It's so unfair. And it would be unfair if you only had one shot at this life, but when you have other shots of the life, yeah, six years old, you die. Next time you're 80, next time 50 or 60, you have all the different combinations. So it doesn't make it such a tragedy when you believe in reincarnation. And another thing is, and this is a tough one, but you know, mothers and parents should remember this every time they give birth, it's not your child. We always think that's my boy, it's my daughter. And we all know as soon as we have this ownership, this possession, this my, the Buddha kept on saying this, me, myself, this causes all the trouble. It's not your child. It's come from a place you don't know where. And it's come into your life. And if you've ever given birth to a child, and I know this from... <laughs> I've never given birth to anybody. <laughs> But I know other people have done given birth, and you know that you come into this, into your, your, out of your womb, you're holding a being there. It's got history. It's not a combination of you and your husband, or you and your wife. This is a new being with history. It's got a past. And so it's an old being coming into your life. It's visiting you. It's, you don't own it. And your job is like a gardener, to nurture it. You know, to bring it up, and then when it gets to 18 or 19, earlier or later, it's going to leave you. It never was yours to begin with. And if you could only remember that, a lot of the suffering of having kids would not be yours. You're nurturing, visiting them, they, they come into your life, and they're going to go again afterwards. They are anicca, impermanent. They're not yours. Not my son. Often parents say that. They say, when it's naughty, that's not my son, it's your son. <laughs> <laughs> when they're good, yeah, that's my son. <laughs> but no, it never is your child. And if you can remember that basic Buddhism, when these things happen, you nurtured the kid, you loved them to bits, you had a wonderful time together, it only lasted six years. Be thankful for those six years. It's because we have the wrong view and the wrong framework, we have so much suffering. Kids do die. And when they do die, we think, why did they die? They're too young to die. That is where we have the sin, which I often tell at funerals of kids who die. The old monk who told me this story, he was in a small hut in the north of Thailand, in some jungle somewhere, years and years and years ago. It's a great story. And he said his hut was very simple, just bamboo and thatch, you know, in the jungle by himself. One day there was a storm, one evening, and the winds were so strong that first branches came crashing down, then whole trees were uprooted and came smashing down in the forest, right, right around him. And he knew, if not just a tree, if a big branch fell on that hut, it was only bamboo, it would go straight through and probably crush him, if not actually killing him just breaking his body and probably die slowly. It was very dangerous. But all he could do is sit there and wait all night. 
and this hope that the trees did fall on his hut. And of course, he could tell the story which meant that nothing did fall on his hut. And in the morning, I wonder why this is, the storms tend to stop in the morning. In the morning, he got out of his hut to look at the damage. And the first thing he noticed, there were some really big branches which just missed his hut. He was really lucky to survive. But then what he noticed, which was an important part of this story, were the leaves on the forest floor, the ones which had been torn off by the heavy winds and lay dead on the forest floor, mostly old brown leaves, which had lived a full lifespan on the twigs and branches. But among <coughs> those old brown leaves were many yellow leaves as well. They're not really fully finished their life. And of course, he saw many green leaves dead on the floor. Amongst the green leaves, there was a few leaves who had that fresh, you know, pale green color to show they'd probably just sprouted the day before, maybe two days before at most. They too lay dead on the forest floor, torn off from life by the wind. And then you look to see what leaves were left on the tree. And of course, as you would expect, there mostly the green leaves left on the tree. But even though a few young green leaves lay dead on the floor, still there was a few old brown leaves curled up, still hanging on, even though the young ones had died. And he realized just as when storms go through the forest, they pick mostly the old leaves a few middle-aged leaves, some young leaves, and some very young leaves, leaving the curly old brown leaves on the tree. In the same way in life. Life mostly takes the old brown leaves. But it sometimes takes yellow leaves, green leaves, and even leaves which have just been sprouting the day before. They too get taken, the young people, even though a few curly old brown leaves still remain on the tree. As I look around me, I can see many curly old brown leaves <laughs> <laughs> still hanging on while young people die. Is there anything wrong with that? No, that's the nature of storms through forests. That's the nature of death coming through our communities. Why don't you understand the simile of the leaves? Never again will you think something's gone wrong, that young people die, while old people keep on living. This is part of nature. So we have to accept that nature. It's the truth of things. It's the laws of life. So if you understand that, then you may understand why young kids die as well. Dear Ajahn, in Bodhinyana Monastery, there are two photos on a shrine there, Ajahn Shah and somebody else. Who is the other monk? How do you inspire you with metta? Oh, that other monk. That's the secret monk. If you find out that secret, the identity of the other monk, who knows, you may be getting somewhere. That's Ajahn Man, that's Ajahn Chah's teacher, that's all it was. Ajahn Man and Ajahn Chah on that shrine. So how do you be present and be kind at the same time during meditation? It's easy. You be... Um, uh, you're just here now, you're kind right now. Then you're present and you're kind. Whenever you give a present to someone, isn't that an act of kindness? So, present is a gift, a gift of kindness. So what you're doing, you're being kind to yourself to let go of the past and the future, which is just a burden. Why do you keep carrying it around? It's mental cruelty to keep worrying about the future, which 99% of the time doesn't happen at all. And as for the past, it's totally gone, you can't change it. You're just burdening yourself. So, it's kind to be in the present. So that's why you're in the present and you're kind at the same time. Being in the present is kind. And then when you're in the present moment, be kind to what, what you're experiencing. Oh, I'm tired. Oh, but I'm kind to the tiredness. I like being kind to the things which no other people like. You like that? You always you know, stick up for, for things no one else likes. That's why 
I'm really always kind to snakes, because not many people like snakes. So if I see a snake, I'm really kind to the snake, because no one else likes them. So if I have pain, I'm really kind to the pain, because no one else likes pain. So pain, you can come and visit Ajahn Brahm. <coughs> so whatever I experience, I'm kind to. Happiness, pain, tiredness, I'm kind to tiredness. It's there for a purpose. It's telling me I've been working too hard. Too many interviews, too many questions, too much good look. <laughs> so it's teaching me a lesson, so I'm kind to it and I respect my tiredness. So that's how you can be present and kind at the same time. Today, dear Ajahn, before meditation, I remembered how the Buddha had used the great earth as a witness to his awakening. I used the recollection of the great earth and its nurturing aspect to calm anxiety in the body and recall that the body belongs to the great earth. What do you think about using the great earth idea as a means of feeling love and compassion towards anxiety? Yeah, this is the Buddha just whenever you see him touching the earth. That was apparently Mara said, who the hell do you think you are sitting here and trying to become enlightened? And he touched the earth and said, the earth, I've been walking on this earth for many lifetimes, I've done such good deeds, let the earth bear witness that I am ready to become enlightened. So the myth goes. So, there's many things about the earth. One of the great things is that you can. You can urinate on the earth, you can pour scented water on the earth, and whatever you do, the earth doesn't mind. The earth doesn't complain. Not like you do. You can make great sounds. Do you complain when somebody bangs the door? The earth never complains. Whatever you do to the earth, the earth is equanimous. That's why it's called Great Earth. So that's why whatever happens to the earth, it's always equanimous. That's why you might say, anxiety in the body, be equanimous. It's only anxiety. So just let it be. So that means you can feel love and compassion towards anxiety. You just let it be. And it's good the sense that the earth does nurture. Doesn't matter what people do to this earth, it's amazing just how resilient it is. Now it keeps on pushing forth crops and trees and stuff like that to keep us fed and keep the earth beautiful. It's amazing this earth. So no matter what we do to it, it's still kind back to us. So whatever you do to your mind, it's always kind back to you. So you be kind to the mind and then the mind will be even more beautiful. Sort of. Anyway, dear Ajahn, my father passed away last October. The funeral was agreed and, tr and tried to be conducted in the Buddhist way. However, there is interruption from sister-in-law and her mother who are Taoist. They try to scare people and wanting other siblings and relatives to follow the superstitious way, which is very selfish. Until now, they would still carry out some rituals for my late father. My concern is, if the rituals are unwholesome, I don't know, would that affect anything to my late father? I try to be harmonious with him. Please advise. No, the father wouldn't worry about that. He just thinks, oh, that's just my stupid relations. And so, oh, gee, even when I'm dead, they give me trouble. <laughs> but as far as you're concerned, you know, you do your stuff for your, for your um, father. And the Buddhist, the Buddhist way, I've been to many funerals. You know, because sometimes it's other people I know, and I go to this funeral and that for Christian funerals, Muslim funerals, or whatever. And the Buddhist funerals are by far the best. I'm not saying that because I'm a Buddhist. You know, because people are going to be reincarnated again, it's not such a loss. You, know, you just can't get rid of your relations that easily. They're going to come back again. Oh, God. <laughs> 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 but it's nice to know that it's just a temporary party. And so they're not so sort of sad. And you know, a lot of times that I've seen some of the priests, especially the Christian priests, they just make it sad. I've seen a girl go, oh, it's so sad that you know, this wonderful person has just died. They were such a kind and, and generous person and the wife is really sad. And in the joke, the wife tells her son, he said, go and check who that's in there. That doesn't sound like my husband. <laughs> <laughs> because a priest always says these things and doesn't even know what they're talking about. Actually, that, there's one thing I remember from my father's funeral. Now, my father was actually an atheist. But, you know, because my mother didn't really know what to do, she just got the local priest to do the service. And there the priest was actually saying these things. He never knew my dad. And he was saying all these things which were not true. 
And actually, that, I remember that, and that really upset me as a 16-year-old kid. This was my father, and the priest actually was saying things which, you know, it was trying to console everybody, but it made matters worse because he wasn't truthful. He's a good, God-fearing man, and he's gone up to heaven with the other Christians. He wasn't even a Christian, he was an atheist. He never believed in God. <laughs> but I didn't feel like saying that in the middle of the service. So, so <laughs> sometimes a lot of these services are so sham, and instead of actually just saying we, get, we really are going to respect the positive, you know, the good bricks in the wall, and not define a person for one bad brick when they actually died, can you define a life just by its death? And that's what we, is that what we want to remember them for, the dying? What about remember them for the living? And that's, you know, most funerals these days in Australia, you know, they're very positive, a lot of fun, telling all the silly stories, what they did when they were young. And those are really joyful. You really are remembering a person as they want to be remembered. At your funeral, do you want people to be sad? Or do you want people to remember you? Ajahn Brown's favourite jokes. I remember the time he told it. It was a terrible joke, but it was just good fun. That's what I want to be remembered by, by all my bad jokes. <laughs> <laughs> and all your kindness. So instead of actually getting miserable at a funeral, please, I mean, do it properly and just remember the beautiful thing about having known that person for so long. What a wonderful time you had together. So much love, so much joy, so much fun. So the mistakes, you were human beings as well. And when you do that, that funeral has meaning. Instead of these really sombre and people crying and beating their breasts and goodness knows what else, which is just really ridiculous. So anyway, that's the best way, is the Buddhist way. And look, I had these great compliments. I remember just giving a, this funeral service once, and the funeral director, these guys who wear black, who sit at the back, he came up to me and said, look, I've been, it's about the third or fourth funeral you've done. I'm not a Buddhist, but when I die, I'm booking you. <laughs> <laughs> that's a really nice compliment, you know, from a Christian who said, no, I want you to do my funeral, because that's the sort of funeral I like. I want to inspire people, uplift people. You know, so they remember me with, with joy, with fun, with laughter, not with tears. Dear Ajahn, can you conduct a guided meditation half an hour, thank you? Or do one at the very end. This was asked earlier. It's really hard to get you all together to do a guided meditation. I did think of doing it at 2 o'clock, but the, when I thought of doing that, I counted there's only about 16 people in here at 2 o'clock, so it's a waste of time. So we'll do one at the very end. Ah, I know this is an interesting one. Sometimes you get some weird... Actually, I think this is the same... The same question the other day about having sex and jhanas. It was the same sort of writing. <laughs> You've got some, it is the same writing, I recognise it. This must be some sort of sex fiend. <laughs> <laughs> I, <laughs> I told my husband that he could have a girlfriend. This is because I don't want to have sex with him and that is because I'm not in love with him. Is this okay? This is different to the traditional Christian idea of marriage. Yeah, I got this idea from someone who told me she has a boyfriend while her husband has a girlfriend and it's working out very well. Comments. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know whether I should answer this. Whichever way I answer it, I'm going to get in trouble. You know that sometimes, <laughs> sometimes the Buddha said that one of the ways of answering questions is through silence. <laughs> <laughs> I think I might be better be silent on this one. Uh, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, if you don't love a person, you have a husband or a wife and the relationship's not working out, and if you really can't get it back together again, you know, might as well just wonder why you're living together. You know, might as well just separate and just try again if you really want to, second time lucky. Actually, they always say that remarriage, the second time round, is a triumph of hope over experience. <laughs> I like that saying. The second marriage, a triumph of hope over experience. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, sometimes we fall out of love with people. Basically, that love, like anything else, can be anicca. You know, sometimes it's forever. And sometimes you see people, they really have this wonderful relationship. And it's not just sexual anymore, it's just they really just have a connection together, an emotional and spiritual connection. They're really good friends and they're very close together for life. It's wonderful to see that. But sometimes that people marry, especially in the early, marry young, and they don't really know what they're doing, just because, you know, he's hot, she's gorgeous, 
and they get a nice, you know, they feel good in each other's company. But sometimes that doesn't work out, and after a while they have to get divorced. There's nothing wrong with getting divorced if it's for the right reasons. And if you ever do go through a divorce, a separation, please don't blame anybody and don't blame yourself. It just happens. It's anicca, okay? Impermanent. This is what the Buddha said. It's not somebody's fault. Some relationships last a long time, some relationships last a short time. This is nature. It's not that you've done something wrong, or he or she's done something wrong, it's just nature, that's all. So don't go blaming people when you have a separation, or feeling guilty, or getting really angry at each other. You know, that doesn't help anybody. So anyway, that if you're not really in love, it's best to get separated, first of all, I would imagine. Or if you want to sort of try and get it back together again, there's lots of things you can do to help. And of course the kids, if there's kids involved, that always makes it very difficult. But anyway, sort of, um, you can convert to being a Muslim, then you can have four husbands. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, can, can Muslim women have four husbands? No, the, the men can have four wives. Because we've got equity these days, you know, gender equality, so <laughs> I'm sure that these days... Would you like to have four husbands? <laughs> why is it, and I mentioned this, I think in Singapore, why is it that a man can have four wives, but a wife can only have one husband? The reason is because wives are more intelligent than men. <laughs> <laughs> You're stupid to have four wives. Gee, you know, there must be idiots to want four. <laughs> <laughs> One is more than enough suffering. Can you please kindly explain the karmic effect of a lay person committing suicide under the following circumstances? Have you got some ideas? To avoid or end physical pain. That's not so bad. To end mental or emotional pain. There depends what type of mental pain it is. Usually you can use other things to end mental or emotional pain. Uh, three, no longer serve any person or meaning for living. Did the Buddha commit suicide? He didn't. He's supposed to have eaten meat just before he passed away, and he knew that was going to kill him. He told all the other monks, don't take that. Did he know what he was doing? If you do something, you know it's going to kill you, and you take it and eat it, that is called suicide. Did the Buddha commit suicide? People say, no, of course he didn't, he was a Buddha. But no, think about it. Maybe the Buddha did commit suicide. <laughs> I like being a heretic. That's when you're excommunicated. The great thing about being excommunicated, you can only be excommunicated once. <laughs> once you've done it, you can say whatever you like, and you're free. <laughs> Exactly, him too. You know his story, according to the commentary, you know, he lived after the Buddha, he was the most famous monk after the Buddha passed away. And of course, what people were looking for, they weren't really respecting his teachings, they just wanted his relics. And that's the trouble, you know, relics. Already you're taking so much of my stuff to auction off. I don't know what you're auctioning off next. But, and even this has happened with Ajahn Chah. Even Ajahn Chah kept on saying, forget about relics and stuff. But after he died, they excavated his toilet, <laughs> looking for relics, you know, in the sort of the septic tank. <laughs> that's really gross. These people just so <laughs> it's true, thank you. <laughs> you didn't know that story. Anyway, so these people were following. They were, f they were following Ananda. And there was actually two big kingdoms. And they were almost going to go to war. You die in our kingdom. No, we want to die. Because once you get a, a, a holy monk who's dead and in your kingdom, it's a big, a big stupa, and you get lots of tourists you know, doing their pilgrimage. That happened. There was this saint in Norwich in England. And he became a saint. And people loved him in that area because he went to go visit one of these Catholic saints somewhere, or somewhere in Europe, because they never had any sort of saintly relics in Norwich, in England. Nothing at all, so I had you know, nothing to worship there. So he went, this is absolutely true, he went and they would expose the coffin of one of these ancient states one day a year, and everybody could kiss this dead corpse. 
Now that's gross enough, but what this guy did, he bit off the nose. <laughs> this dead corpse bit off the nose and kept it in his mouth, and that's how he smuggled it out of the cathedral. And he smuggled it all the way to England. And when he got there, they entombed it, and now they had a relic of a saint. He became a saint as well for his services <laughs> to the economy, because now all these pilgrims went to Norwich to worship this saint, because they're now they had relics. That's the extent they went to. Bite off the nose of a dead corpse. Ugh, that's really <laughs> yucky. <laughs> but they were following Ananda, you know, trying to get you know, some relics, and make sure he dies, and he wanted to create some harmony. So he went to the river, dividing these two kingdoms. And according to the story, he rose up into the air, you know, he entered the fire element, type of meditation, and his body instantly cremated, like sometimes you do hear about this spontaneous combustion, which happens by accident. But you know, he did it through willpower, spontaneously combusted, and he made the determination that two equal piles of relics would fall on either side of the back. So the armies, they would not go to war together. So that's actually how, that's really cool stuff. So maybe, you know, if ever I die, I'll make sure that one pile goes to Singapore, one pile goes <laughs> to the BJ, <BGM. laughs> one pile goes. <laughs> no, no, that's really ridiculous. So that's actually what he did. So yeah, maybe he committed suicide too. He made a resolution to enter the fire element and pass away. A willed act. Da -da -da. Dear Ajahn, is it true that Ajahn Mahabur was so attached to jhanas that Ajahn Man had to reprimand him? Not that I know of. No. You can't be attached to jhanas. It, remember what it says, if you don't believe me, I can show you this tomorrow. It's in the past Sadhaka Sutta. We've got a copy of this over in the, um, uh, the office next to where you have your interviews. In the Pasadika Sutta, the Diga Nikaya, the Buddha said, this is the Buddha, okay, not Ajahn Ma, not Ajahn Chah, the Buddha, the boss. He said, if anyone gets attached to the jhanas, they can only expect one of four things. These are the four consequences of being attached to the jhanas. The only four, not five, not three, four possibilities if you get attached to the jhanas. The first possibility is stream winning. The second possibility is once returning. The third possibility is non-returning. And the fourth possibility is full enlightenment. The four stages of enlightenment, that's the only thing which happens if you get attached to the jhanas. You're supposed to get attached to the jhanas. That's a being attached to the raft which carries you across the stream, the Eightfold Path raft, including the jhana. Yeah, you eventually let it go. Once you're over the stream, you don't let go of the raft when you're halfway across the stream. People say, as monks, are you always attached or you should always let go? And I said the other day, when you're on the back of a motorbike, attach. <laughs> <laughs> when you're on the top rung of a ladder painting something, attach. Don't let go, for goodness sake. Would it be okay for the other monks and the nuns to introduce themselves and tell us what they like best about being a monk or a nun? Thank you very much. Wait, I, sh I, should, I should warn you already, the nuns and the monks. It is the tradition here. Those of you who have been on these retreats know the very last evening, they're going to disappear now on the last evening. <laughs> the last evening, which is a Friday, I usually disappear to give the Friday night talk at Nolamara. There's many thousands of people listen to that on the internet. So the questions and answers, I won't be here to answer the questions in two nights' time. So the questions will be answered by this monk, <coughs> by that nun, and the nun at the back. <laughs> and you aren't allowed to hide. <laughs> so you can ask questions. So make, make sure they're not too sort of, you know, uh, hard questions. I remember when we did that years ago, one of the people asked a question. It was you know, the young monks, they were just novices, I think. And they asked, who do you like the best? Um, Scarlett Johansson, <laughs> Madonna, or 
I forget if he had a sort of, you know, some floozy in the media. <laughs> so they had to answer that question. They're just you know, seeing what type of young monks they were. So you can ask, you know, the young nuns, say, who do you like the best, Justin Bieber? <laughs> <laughs> Brad Pitt? Or Ajahn Brahm? <laughs> Let's see what they answer. Okay. <laughs> That's some fun. When letting go, bliss arises. To get into jhana, do I keep watching the bliss or turn to the breath to get deeper? Keep watching the bliss. Basically, the, you know, the mind wants to watch the bliss, so let the mind do what it needs to do. The mind is much more clever than you are. So stop controlling. When the breath disappears, it's meant to disappear. That's the whole point. With the breath disappearing, the five senses have gone. Now you've just got the sixth sense, the mind. It's a natural progress if you just make peace. In other words, you're being aware and you're being kind. It happens naturally. And many people who have their deep meditation, they say it, they never did anything. They just were flowing along with things they never control. They never decide, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. That was calm, that was peaceful, which is why they got the jhanas. So just don't do anything, for goodness sake. Especially when you're deep. You've got so far, so deep. Don't, don't mess it up now by making choices at the very end. Just let it go. There is a Discovery documentary video in YouTube on a Nepalese monk who can float above the ground during meditation. How can this be explained by physics? Are the monks allowed to display such acts as pub uh, in public? Thank you. I can't do that because I'm too fat. <laughs> You'll take... <laughs> You've got to be very thin and light to be able to lift yourself. <laughs> no, no, no. It's usually, I don't know about this, but sometimes you don't know whether that's a real documentary or whether it's fake, because sometimes you don't know what's going on in these documentaries these days. You can do anything on sort of um, uh, on TV these days. But you just ask, what did the monk want to do that for anyway? What's the point of that? The Buddha said, monks, don't go showing off your psychic powers because that Nepalese monk, if he can float above the ground during meditation, he should be going to Rio de Janeiro for the Brazil Olympic Games. He can represent Nepal in the high jump and the pole vault and he'd always get gold. Would that, would that be cheating? Do you think? Would that be cheating if we got, say, someone in Singapore to levitate and they could represent Singapore in the Olympic Games. They get the pole vault, they can get the, um, the long jump, they can just meditate, just keep on levitating and a couple of miles later down the road, no one will beat that. The hurdles, that would be very easy. So you get lots of gold medals for Singapore if you know you get your monks to actually, to, to actually start entering the Olympics. <laughs> No, it's just a really silly thing to do. That's why we don't try and do any tricks. So if we do have psychic powers, we keep them quiet. So nobody knows. Otherwise you become a lab rat. With all these all these scientists poking things into your brain to find out how come the laws of physics are just confounded by this monk or this nun. But there is one psychic power, the Buddha said, that you can show off. And it's the only psychic power which the Buddha recommended. And that brilliant teaching, the psychic power of teaching the Dhamma. So that's the only thing which really has power, to teach the Dhamma and make people enlightened. That's the only psychic power the Buddha recommended. Hi Ajahn, I thought all monks are supposed to shave their head. Why the Buddha is not bald? Why the Buddha's ears are so long? Thanks Ajahn, with metta. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. I don't know, the Buddha's gone now, I can't ask him. Now what happens again, this is that hagiography, where the, after, you know, they always want the Buddha to be something special, something different not the same as everybody else. And so they have long ears, a bump on his head, that one's got a flame coming out. Have you ever seen anyone with a flame coming out like that? 
And if you do, you'd be really weird. You'd think you're some alien or something. But the truth of the matter is that there's many stories, you know, in the sutras, and these are valid stories, where people came across the Buddha and they didn't know who he was. You know, if there was really long ears or that Afro haircut, then it is Afro. You know, then you would sort of obviously know this was a, a different person than the ordinary person. There was this one case, this monk, uh, he, would, he was been ordained by one of uh, the Buddha's disciples and he was actually traveling to meet the Buddha to ask them questions. And the Buddha was also traveling another direction and they, they spent the night together in a potter's shed. And uh, this, uh, <laughs> this disciple, you know, said, no, is it all right if I... I think the disciple got there first and the Buddha said, look, I've just come, is it, can we share the place tonight? And the guy said, yeah, certainly, monk, you can share the place tonight. And then so the monk started meditating and the Buddha started meditating and the monk was finished. Said, this monk is really meditating well, I better meditate as well. And so, you know, the Buddha obviously never moved and so the monk never moved and they meditated together all night and in the morning he said, you know, you meditate very well, said this young monk to the Buddha, you know, who's your teacher? And this Buddha said, I have no teacher. He said, what do you mean you've got no teacher? So I'm the Buddha. Oh my God. <laughs> 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 I spent the whole night with the Buddha and I didn't recognize, I didn't pay proper respects, so oh, please forgive me. And the Buddha said, no, great, you know, you did the right thing. And the point was that this monk never recognized the Buddha. He looked like every other monk. And even in the last year of the Buddha's life, Ajata Sutta went to the bamboo grove. When he went into the hall, this is in the Samanyapala suit, he had to ask Jivaka, which one of these monks is the Buddha? So they, he never stood out as you know, physically any different than anybody else. So when we made our Buddha statue in Bodhinyana Monastery, we did ask, can we take all these bumps and flames off and just have, a, you know, and have real ears instead of these elongated ears? And the artist in Thailand actually reminded him, he said, no, we can't do that. Because this is the thing which actually symbolizes the Buddha in, um, in, uh, in <coughs> statue law, whatever it is called. Um, in, what's it called when you make statues? Sculpture. So these are the things which say, this is the Buddha. Because if you didn't have those things, you wouldn't know whether it was a statue of a monk or a statue of the Jain Mahavira. This actually signifies the Buddha. So it's the symbols which sculptures know in the future, historians know this means the Buddha. So they always have a bit of long ears, those curly bits on the head, and either a bump or a flame coming out. So that's why we had to do the same, we had a little bump coming on the top of his head. So that's actually just a tradition. So we know that sculpture represents the Buddha. It's not how the Buddha looked, but it represents the Buddha. So that's why we have it. Thanks for showing us a path of peace. With more mental energy, I'm finding my sleep is broken, but pleasant still. For some reason, I'm finding sleeping on the floor for part of the night is more relaxing. Please explain. Also, can you meditate so much? Can you meditate too much, even if you are enjoying it? Of course, you can never meditate too much. If you enjoy it, wonderful. And you're sleeping on the floor. Oh no, sometimes sleeping on the floor may be cooler for you, because it's sometimes a bit warm at night and it might be that's the reason why you like it, or maybe it's good for your back, I'm not quite sure. But if it works, do it. I don't ask too many questions. If it works, just do it. Can a patient with induced coma enter jhana? Oh God, I never thought of that one before. If so, how would the doctor know that the patient is not dead? Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Ha, ha, ha. Ahem. Induced karma. In induced coma. can they enter jhana? Yes, they can. How can the doctor know that the patient is not dead? The reason is actually they're warm. That is the only difference between being dead and being in jhana. The body retains its heat, it doesn't go cold. So, if ever you see someone and you think they'll be meditating, you think they're dead, just see if they're warm. If they're warm, they're in jhana. If they're cold, they're dead. So that's actually the, the truth. It's in the Maha Vedala Sutta or something. But it was this uh, one guy, you know, you know the story of a guy here in Perth who got into jhana and was taken to the hospital. Actually, the doctor said that was one of the reasons they never actually put him in the mortuary. They gave him these defibrillators to try and get him out of, uh, they thought he was dead. But he was warm all the time. 
he wasn't cold. That was the one difference in being dead. Dear Ajahn, you said, do not fear when Ajahn Brahm is here. There are many things I fear. Ghosts, losing breath during meditation, taking chances of life, and this goes on. What is the cause of fear? Knowing it might help. Oh, the cause of fear, number one, is you're looking into the future with negativity. Thinking of all the things which might go wrong. And of course they can go wrong, but the likelihood of them going wrong is very small. I like telling the story, when I went to Singapore once, to give a large number of talks. That was a time when uh, they put an advertisement for my talks on the back of a Singapore bus. I remember going, we can go to Singapore, trying to find the bus to take photos. Because we have a saying in the West, you've got a face like a back of a bus. <laughs> and for once that was true about me. I did have a face <laughs> like the back of a bus. So, the Buddhist Fellowship in Singapore had gone to all this expense advertising and hiring, it was the, um, what's it called? Uh, what was that convention center in the middle of town? Suntec, yes, yeah, Suntec City, yeah. A big, um, big hall in there. Advertised it for great expense. And that day I arrived was the peak of the SARS crisis. I remember reading the newspaper on the aircraft just before I landed. And it's this big in black letters, 99 people had SARS. And the government had closed all the schools. And the Singapore government had asked, no public meetings. And I was to go and do four or five talks in a row in this big Suntec auditorium. And the Buddhist Fellowship, they had paid so much money to hire this place and advertise. I remember the committee were there at the Changi airport, afraid, what should we do? Should we cancel? What should we do? And then I told them, let's do some math. Nineteen, what, what is the population of Singapore? At that time it was about 4 million. So 99 people have SARS. That means 3,999,901 people haven't got SARS. So that means there's a 40,000 to 1 chance you won't get SARS. That's really good odds. If you were making a bet, 40,000 to 1 is a pretty good odds. So I said, let's go ahead. 40,000 to 1 will be okay. And so we did go ahead. And remember, SARS was sudden acute respiratory system. It's a disease of the lungs. How is the best way to avoid respiratory problems is to exercise the respiratory system. And what's the best way to do that? But to laugh. So I deliberately told many stupid jokes, made people laugh, sadhu, 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 make people happy. And they exercised their lungs so much that protected them from SARS. So it was actually a very healthy thing to do. <laughs> but the whole point was, we see 99 people, and that's all we see. We see what's wrong, and we get afraid. Instead of thinking of how many people don't get SARS. We had that uh, in, say, UK, in London, an underground tube was blown up by a terrorist. And many people didn't actually go anymore on the underground. And if you look to the odds, the number of people traveling every day, the number of people got killed, it was insignificant. There's more chance of getting killed you know, by probability in a car crash than on the underground with a terrorist. But the people don't think that. They get so afraid they're just not rational anymore. So the story I always remember, Winnie the Pooh, Winnie the Pooh and Little Piglet were walking in a forest one day and there was a storm coming and trees were falling down. And if one, Little Piglet, he was small and small people are always scared. So he grabbed Pooh's paw and he grabbed it so hard and said, I can't go on, I'm too afraid. What would happen if a tree fell when we were underneath it? And that was a possibility in the storm. And the answer to that fear, and the answer to your fear, is the answer of Winnie the Pooh, who said, instead of saying, what will happen if a tree fell when we were underneath it, how about saying, what will happen if a tree fell when we weren't underneath it? Which was more likely. The positive aspect of the future, instead of the negative. What would happen if, plus something negative, is called fear? 
what would happen if, and something positive is the antidote of if. And that's all you need to do to have a positive mind to the future. Then you have no fear at all. So, are you afraid of ghosts? What would happen if a ghost came tonight? And the answer is, what would happen if a ghost didn't come tonight? Then you're not afraid anymore. Did you get that? Be positive, for goodness sake. The Ajahn, as I get deeper into my meditation, I see an eye, not human and not benevolent. Ooh, it starts, this is good stuff. I love weird stuff, an eye. And it's not, not human, not benevolent. It starts off as an arm and shape, then becomes reptilian. It's always the same sequence of events. I try to ignore it, but I find I'm compelled to look for it. I find that seeing it does take me deeper. Do you think I should look for it or try to ignore it with better? Ah! <laughs> Do remember what I did to my monster. It got reptilian. Put a, a monocle on it. So draw a face around it with a big smiley face you know, underneath the eye. Play with it. Add positivity. Add fun to it. Wink it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's so easy to do that. And once you do that, all the fear disappears. You have fun and that turns into good nimitta. So don't add fear to it. Otherwise it gets into this negative nimitta. Add positive energy to it, laugh, whatever. In the suttas, the Buddha frequently re recommended striving to achieve that which has not been achieved, to attain that which has not been attained, to realize that which not has been released. This is a bad translation. How do we render this passage into English? How does this fit with your teaching not to regard these states as achievements or attainments and to let go of striving and effort? How do you achieve that which has not been achieved? How do you attain that which has not been attained? How do you realize that which has not been realized? What haven't you achieved yet? You haven't achieved stillness, peace, freedom. So know what we're going for. When you know what we're going for, then it's quite clear how to achieve stillness, how to achieve peace, how to realize freedom. And the only way of doing that is through letting go as the Buddha kept on saying. The four ways of letting go in the third noble truth. You know, to let go uh, of all craving, to go against the stream of wanting. It's totally always letting go, to renounce. So it's not a bad translation, but you have to look at it in the context, and it's to achieve that which has not been achieved. What are you trying to achieve? Once you know what you're trying to achieve, it's very clear what the method is. That's why once you know that this meditation is about stillness, about peace, about bliss, about freedom, once you know what it is, then it's quite clear, it's obvious that that thing which you call striving to do things is counterproductive. It just makes more disturbance, which is why so many people, they try to meditate, they never get anywhere. Once you understand it's stillness, it's so obvious, you've got to let go to be still. And once you realize, you know, this is about non-self. Where does non-self fit in? It's obvious. When you do something, your self gets bigger. When you let go, your self diminishes. It disappears. It all really comes together when you put it all together. The striving, the effort, is the striving to stop. The effort to let go of craving. Which is, you know, to stop, it does actually take an effort. Be still. Dear Ajahn Brahm, may one ask what your mind had been doing before you saw the monster Nimitta? Can't remember. I don't know. Dear Ajahn, in terms of <laughs> living in the present, what do you think of social media websites such as Facebook to reconnect with old friends, keep in touch with people who be, might seldom, if ever, actually meet again face to face? Is it a waste of energy, an illusion of friendship, or is it useful? Many thanks for your news. I am on Facebook, apparently. I've never seen it, but I've got Facebook and I've got many friends. Someone else does it, so it's totally anonymous and it's fake because I'm not in Facebook. So, <coughs> I don't know, because I don't know anything about Facebook. So, if it works, fine. But people tend to spend a lot of time on Facebook. And so, sometimes it's just a bit of a waste of time. If you can just 
restrain yourself and just spend a little bit of time on Facebook so it really has a purpose. So you make use of it rather than it uses you, then maybe it'll be okay. Dear Ajahn, would someone be tested before he or she get into jhana, for example, and heard some weird noises, or felt like someone was behind when doing meditation? I felt a bit scary when I was alone, and that was the best time to meditate. I tried to talk to myself. Buddha statue is here, Ajahn Brahm is nearby here, I felt not so scary anymore, but how if I'm back home, and no more protection like in jhana grow? What should I do when I hear these scary noises again? Please advise, Ajahn. That might be your husband behind you. It <laughs> might be your cat. <laughs> Who knows what's following you in your house. So basically, you know a lot of that. When you start to get afraid, you make sort of small things become huge. My story of fear is that I was meditating in the jungle once and I was very mindful. And as I was meditating, I heard a sound of a jungle animal coming to me just after dusk when you can't see, and that's when the animals come out to get their food. So I was very mindful, it was in a bit of a distance, and so I listened to the sound, you know, rustling the leaves and the branches and whatever, and it was a small animal, no problem at all. So I carried on meditating, washing my breath. And as it came closer, I had to reassess it because the noise was much louder than you'd expect from a small animal. It's probably a medium-sized animal, like a civet cat, still no problem at all. But as it came closer, the noise got so loud, I realized that's not a civet cat, that's a big animal. It could be a bear, you know, it could be even a tiger. And tigers would eat monks. So I was a bit scared, but I thought, no, no, you can't be just imagining. As it came closer, I was very aware, very alert, and it really did sound a huge animal. If it was a tiger, it was a big one. So at that point I opened my eyes and showed my flashlight and I saw it. A tiny mouse. <laughs> <laughs> That's all it was. But that really shocked me. You know, how does a tiny mouse sound like a big tiger? And the answer is fear. Fear makes a tiny mouse, it made a tiny mouse in my experience, sound like a huge tiger. And I was mindful, I was careful, I was assessing it, I was trying to be reasonable and logical. That can't be a mouse, it sounds too loud. But when you actually see it, it actually was a tiny mouse. The fear made it huge like a tiger. And if you understand that, you understand me meditating at home, and it's the sound of, I don't know what, maybe just a fly or something, it sounds like a monster is right behind you. <laughs> so please understand that fear amplifies and exaggerates things. If you understand that, then you'll be able to overcome fears. A friend is leaving in a self-sustainable lifestyle. I don't live in a self-sustainable lifestyle. I live in a no-self-sustainable lifestyle, which is much better for a monk. We're supposed to let go of a self instead of having a self-sustainable. So we live in Bodhinyana Monastery, no self-sustainable. He grows his own vegetables and fruit as well as raising chickens, ducks and fish. When he wants protein from meat, he will kill his animals. He meditates and has experienced stillness, timelessness, several times. Does he have a chance to have a nimitta and jhana? It's interesting, I don't know, because, you know, Anguli Mala, he didn't kill chickens, he killed people. And he still managed to get uh, very peaceful, but it's difficult to know that, exactly what his intentions are and what his mind is like. You have to meet people to be able to judge. So uh, basically, I don't know. Is there a custom that a monk cannot give blessings to lay people who are sitting? If so, what is the reason? Of course you can give blessings to people who are sitting. You give blessings to... But sometimes, people ring up for blessings. They call up in the evening and say, look, I'm not feeling very well, can you give me a blessing? So we bless them and say, what are you doing? Maybe on the toilet, I don't know what they're doing. <laughs> but we bless people any time. I remember ringing up a person and tried to speak to them and say, Ajahn Brahm, can you please wait a minute? No, I'm busy, can I ask you now? I said, no. I said, why not? I've just come out of the shower and I've got no clothes on, the woman said. <laughs> what does it matter? I'm on the telephone, I can't see you. But they felt so embarrassed about talking to a monk without any clothes on. What does that matter at all? I can't see you. It's a telephone, okay? It's not Skype. <laughs> <laughs> but they still were embarrassed and I had to hang up and you know, five minutes later, they call me back again. <laughs> That's ridiculous. 
<laughs> so the customer might cannot give blessings to a, a naked girl uh, over the phone. Of course you can. Or if you are sitting, if so, what is the reason? No, you can, you can always give blessings at any time. Last questions. How to strengthen stillness so that defilements can be overcome? Just like that. Number one, shut up. <laughs> Stop thinking. Just be still. Stop. And then you become still. Which is why in life, sometimes people think Australia is not a Buddhist country. Sometimes you think there's no Buddhism in, say, Pakistan or Saudi Arabia. There is Buddhism in those countries. Every time you come to red traffic light, you see, stop. There is the teachings of the Buddha. Every time <laughs> in Singapore, you come to these big stop signs, remember, that is the word of the Buddha. Stop. <laughs> and then you can become still every time in a traffic jam. You're still. They're teaching you the Dharma. A lot of times in modern life, it's just so many reminders if we could only just be aware. And then we know the teachings of the Buddha. So stop. And then you're still. Okay, thank you for all those questions. I hope that some of them were interesting. Some of them may have been funny. Some of them I didn't really know the answers to. But I tried my very best. You know, please don't ask questions about, you know, your husband has sex with your girlfriend or whatever. I don't know the answer to those questions. I haven't had sex for years, for goodness sake, so I don't know what I'm talking about. So, <laughs> to make things more useful, please ask questions about <laughs> meditation instead of this other stuff. But anyway, it's good fun and I'll try my best. I know one thing though, I, if I didn't answer your question properly, please write it again. Because one of the worst things I know of a teacher is if they don't answer the question fully, if they disrespect the question. I try not to do that, but if I have disrespected your question, I apologise, write it again and I give it another try. Because all the questions, they come from really pure hearts, you really want to know the answers. Sometimes it's not really relevant, the answers, so I can't really do it fully. Sometimes it's answers I can't give, but I do try my best to respect every question. So if it wasn't answered, then please ask it again. Okay. Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. <laughs> okay, have a good night.